Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are and the time you are listening to me. Um, um, I'm going to talk over uh, chapter one, solar resource and climatic data. Uh, once again, my name is Emmanuel Ramde, and I'm delivering this course with Dr. Yao Azuma from Tuai. Uh, the learning objectives of the chapter uh, in three points. Uh, to understand the structure of the sun and its characteristics. And number two, to understand the basic concept of uh, solar uh, uh, irradiation, uh, the solar resources, uh, the components of the solar irradiation, the earth, sun geometry, etc. And to know solar radiation measuring equipment. The outline of the chapter is as follows. Uh, number one, fundamentals of solar radiation. And uh, number two, the sun position and direction of beam radiation. Number three, uh, other solar radiation concepts. And lastly, solar radiation measuring equipment. Fundamentals of solar radiation. The sun, what is it? The sun is um, a thermonuclear reactor where you have about 600 million tons of hydrogen being combined each second to form helium, as described by the following equation. So um, it's a special star. The diameter is about 101,400,000 kilometers. And uh, the, its volume is about so 1,300,000 greater than the volume of the Earth. Uh, it is located at about 150 million kilometers far from the Earth. That's the, the, the average, the mean distance. And uh, its uh, effective black body uh, is uh, about 6,000 Kelvin. So let's come back to the, the nuclear reaction that takes place within the sun. Uh, basically, you have two types of nuclear reactions. You have the fission, where a bigger nucleus will split up and give birth to smaller nuclei. That is fission. And that technology is currently used in all nuclear plants in the world for generating electricity. The other uh, nuclear reaction is fusion, where you have smaller nuclei being combined to give a bigger nucleus. This particular one is what is happening in the sun, where you have smaller nuclei, hydrogen nuclei, being combined to give rise to helium, a much uh, bigger uh, nucleus. And uh, in that process, it releases some energy. The two, whether fission or fusion, they all release energy. But you have to note that fusion reaction releases more energy than fission. And uh, that is one of the reasons why today uh, fusion is not applied. The energy is so huge. The temperatures involved in fusion reaction is ha so huge that you cannot imagine handling that amount of you know, temperature. So it's, uh, uh, the, the question is to find equipment uh, that could handle that huge amount of temperatures. So it's a, a kind of material science problem. Good. So the sun, because of the high temperature, it supplies energy in all the directions. Uh, and it's being said that that energy is about 8,000 8, to 10,000 times the Earth energy needs. And um, the maximum solar energy received on top of our atmosphere, averagely is about 1,367 watts per square meter. That's just above the atmosphere. And this number here is being called the solar constant. 
Good. Um, talking about the lifespan of the sun, it's believed that the sun is having 10 billion years of lifespan. And it is halfway through. So it remains another, it remains 5 billion years for the sun to live. Okay, it's normal. It's a reaction taking place. And as any reaction, if you don't be replacing the combustible material, okay, the reaction will end someday. So it applies for the sun. The sun will die out someday. And it's believed that uh, it's left 5 billion years for the sun to go away. So when you talk about renewable energy, Renewable energy that is something that you can uh, renew okay, within the lifespan of human being. Averagely, if human being lives 80 years, 100 years, so that energy should be able to be renewed within that. That's why wood energy is believed to be renewable energy because you plant a tree, you cut it today, you can plant it back and... Uh, and uh, you can get it back within the lifespan of human being. Okay? Uh, wind energy, same wise. It comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. Uh, hydro energy, same wise. Uh, for the sun, because it's about 5 billion years, okay? You have day and night, okay? It goes, it comes, it goes, it comes. So in terms of 5 billion years, and human perspective, we believe that the sun energy is renewable energy. Good. Um, talking about the sun radiation, the sun radiates as you and I will radiate. But because we have low temperatures, so we radiate uh, in some range that is not uh, much visible. Okay. But the sun temperature is so high compared to you and I. So the sun radiates in the range of invisible ultraviolet light through visible range and then to infrared radiation. Okay? Uh, you are much aware that there are other forms of radiation uh, like uh, uh, radio waves being used in our cell phones, mobile phones, uh, microwaves used for cooking, um, you have X-rays, etc., etc. Okay, so the solar radiation lies within the ultraviolet radiation, the visible range, and then the invisible uh, range. Okay, so um, the percentage distribution of these three radiations is about eight percent for ultraviolet. 38% for visible and 52% uh, for near infrared radiation. Now, we spoke about the solar constant. The solar constant, as I said, if you look at this uh, picture, uh, the picture shows the Earth, the surface of the Earth. It shows the boundary of the atmosphere, which is roughly about 200 and 2,500 kilometers above the Earth. So just above the atmosphere, we believe that the rest is vacuum. All right? And uh, the solar constant is the solar power measured on a square meter surface and averagely it is 1,367. I said averagely because if you look at on the right hand side you have a formula that gives you the variation of that solar constant GSC solar constant uh, with respect to the day of the year. It varies. It varies simply because the sun path 
is not constant. It varies with the days of the year. At times it gets closer to the earth, at times it gets further. So because of that, the solar constant will vary in the range of about 3%. So, the solar constant is an average, but it varies from day to day. But just before this power, 1367 enters the, 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 the atmosphere, okay? when it enters, some of the radiation are going to be absorbed by any matter that the radiation meets. Some will be reflected back to the sky. Others will be scattered. And others again will be able to pass through without uh, going through none of this. So what goes through directly is called direct radiation. What has been scattered is called diffuse radiation. Okay? So, in normal circumstances, because all these phenomena will, 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 will reduce the solar constant, when you measure the solar power at a given location on the Earth, you will get much, much lesser than uh, the 1,367. You can get something like 500 watt per square meter. You can get 700 square per, per square meter on average. Okay? Good. So, coming again, when the solar rays, the solar radiation enters the atmosphere, Remember again, before the atmosphere is assumed to be vacuum, so the solar radiation doesn't meet any matter. But when it enters the atmosphere, immediately it's going to go through scattering, absorption, and reflection. Okay? So, and the picture on the left of the screen shows you that some radiation are able to get to the inclined surface directly, okay, without being scattered, neither absorbed, and neither reflected. Others, unfortunately, uh, will meet some matter like clouds, okay? Remember that the atmosphere is made up of cloud, dust, water vapor, etc., etc., okay? So, um, the solar radiation will be scattered. And uh, because it is scattered, okay, it's going to be diffused. Diffused means coming from all the directions. Okay? So, in summary, if you have an inclined surface, okay, the inclined surface will receive radiation coming directly, called direct radiation. You will receive the scattered radiation called diffuse radiation. And uh, direct radiation coming to the ground surface can be also be reflected back. And if the surface is inclined, it can receive that radiation. If the surface is not inclined and the surface is horizontal, okay, the surface will not receive the ground reflected radiation simply because uh, the surface will be lying flat on the ground, with part of the ground, so the ground cannot reflect solar radiation onto itself. That's why horizontal surfaces will not receive the ground reflected radiation, but rather um, the diffuse and then the beam radiation. Good. Still talking about the solar and the earth geometry. Um, if you look at this picture here, you have the sun on the left and the earth on the right. And uh, you take two extreme cases where you have one ray 
coming from one end of the sun and the other ray coming from the other end of the sun. And they are all going to the earth. Okay? By the time they reach the earth, they would have made some angle of 32 minutes. Half a degree. Half a degree between them. And because the angle between them is so small, imagine half a degree between the solar radiation. And that's the two extremities. So we assume that all the rays coming in from the sun to the earth are all parallel. Because the angle they are making between them is so small. Now, what is solar time? Solar time is different from the standard time. The time that you and I will use day to day, the solar time is different. Um, there are two reasons for that. Uh, the number one reason, it is different simply because the sun in its movement, the path is not constant. So it accounts for some correction factor, which in this equation is called E. The second reason why standard time differs from solar time is because we base our standard time on differences of longitudes. But from one longitude to the other, you have a large coverage, geographical coverage of the Earth. So basically, you find uh, countries like Burkina, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, having the same standard time, civilian time. But they don't see the sun at the same time. An example is a solar eclipse. Some time ago, it happened solar, solar eclipse in, uh, in, in West Africa. Uh, though we have the same civilian time, there are some parts of West Africa that could not see the solar eclipse, meaning that we don't see the sun at the same time, though we are using the same civilian time. So there is something to be corrected. So, and uh, this second term that you see here, four times LST minus LOC, okay, is the second correction, okay? I come over again. First correction is simply because the sun path is not constant throughout the year. And secondly, because the, uh, uh, between two longitudes, it pounds many, many, many geographical areas to the extent that people living even within the same longitude don't see the sun at the same time. So there should be a second correction. And when you do these corrections, you get the true solar time. The solar time is the time that we use in all sun calculations. We don't use the, the standard civilian time. An example, if we are in Kumasi and the standard time is showing 15.30 GMT on April the 15th, in using the previous formula but to compute, you find that the solar time in Kumasi in that particular day is actually 15.14. Okay. So there is 16 minutes difference between our civilian time and the solar time. Please work it out and check it, the answer. Now, we want to harness the solar energy. Uh, but that energy depends on where you are and also where the sun is. Okay? The sun is moving. So in order for you to appreciate the solar energy, you need to know the position of the sun. 
So in these following section slides, we are going to go through some geometries, some angles that we normally use in solar calculations in order to locate the sun. Because the energy that you are going to get from the sun depends on the sun position. Good. They, there are a couple of angles. You may not need all of them at a go at the same time, but it's good to know their existence. Okay? The number one angle that you must know is latitude. Latitude phi. Uh, latitude phi has already been defined when you and I were in uh, basic schools. It's simply the angular location north or south of the equator. So it pans from minus 90 to plus 90. That's the latitude on the Earth. So it's no different that we are going to use here. And uh, remember that the second angle that we use to locate a point on, on the surface of the Earth is longitude. So latitude and longitude. Okay. So we are going equally to use similar angles when we want to locate the sun. Good. There is one important angle that accounts for seasons. That angle is called declination. Declination is due to the fact that the Earth axis, the north-south pole axis, is not vertical. That axis is inclined. Inclined to some angle. And because of that, when the sun rotates around the earth, not all parts of the sun of the earth has been uh, exposed to the sun at the same time. Likely. Okay. Uh, what is declination uh, concretely? Look at this picture on your right hand side. Uh, it's made up of some imaginary circle, okay, which we call in solar term the celestial circle. And then in the middle of that circle you have the earth. Okay. And then you have the sun rotating and following the surface of the, that imaginary sphere. So, if you look at the plane of the equator, the plane containing the equator, that will also be inclined because the axis is inclined. So, the plane of the equator, follow the cursor, will also be inclined. And then, if you take the plane containing the sun path around the earth. Between the equator plane and the sun plane, there is an angle. And that angle is said to be 23.5 degrees. Now, what is concretely declination? If you take one axis or one line, that lies just on top of the equator, the equatorial plane. And you take another line from the center of the Earth to the center of the Sun, the two lines will form an angle. And that angle varies depending on the position of the Sun. So as the Sun moves to the right, Follow my cursor, 
that angle that I've just described will be reducing and will come to zero. When it comes to zero, it's called equinox. And then the angle will start opening up again, okay? And we get to some maximum, that's 23.5. And then we start again reducing. And then we start increasing again and again. So because of that variation of the angle, that's an angle called declination. So some parts of the earth will be exposed to the sun while other parts are not. That explains why in the northern hemisphere, around January, December, it is cold, while in the southern hemisphere, it is summertime, it is hot, and then vice versa. Um, the declination angle does not depend on the location where you are on the earth. It's the same declination for everyone on the earth. It only depends on one parameter, that's the day of the year. Where you are doesn't matter. The earth is inclined and is inclined for everybody on the earth, irrespective to where you are, whether you are in Kigali, Morovia, in Kaino, uh, Lagos, or why in Ghana you are having the same declination on, a, on the same day. An example, on August the 16th, the declination angle is about 13.45. So 13.45 may be where exactly the sun is now, okay? All right. So that's about declination angle. There are other angles as well that we use in solar calculations. Slope is when you are considering a solar collector or a solar panel. You are inclining it when you are fixing it to some angle, beta. Beta is simply called the slope of your solar panel. There is uh, another angle called our angle. You know, the Earth rotates 360 degrees within 24 hours. So we would like to know one hour how many degrees the Sun, the Earth rotates. It's simply 360 degrees divided by 24 hours. That gives you 15 degrees. So the Earth in its rotation, daily rotation, will rotate 15 degrees per hour to form the 360 degrees within 24 hours, right? So now, if you want to know, we take a reference point. The reference point will be solar noon, 12 hours. So if you want to know the actual angle in a particular day, if you want to know the actual angle that the sun does, the solar angle, just take your reference point, take the time at which you are, make the difference with solar noon, and then multiply it by the 15 degrees. That will give you the hour angle. An example, if the time is 15, zero, zero. From 15.00, from solar noon to 
you have three hours. If one hour makes 15 degrees, then three hours would then make 45 degrees. Okay, that's the hour angle when you have 15 hours solar time. Remember that um, in many solar books, time is written in the 24 hours format. And also remember that in all solar calculations, we use the solar time, not the standard time. Okay? If it is given and it is in standard time, you then need to convert it into solar time. Good. The angle of incidence of beam radiation, that one also has a direct impact on the, on the energy that you collect. The angle that beam radiation makes with a normal to a surface. The surface is collecting the sun energy. Any surface has a normal that is perpendicular to the surface. So, and beam radiation is just one single beam, one single line. It makes some angle with the normal to your surface. Okay. And how do you compute that angle that it makes? Since the sun is moving, okay, every day, so how do you compute that angle? The formula that you see here allows you to compute that. In this formula, we've seen that delta is the declination angle, and declination angle depends only on the day of the year. You have the hour angle. Hour angle depends only on the time of the day. And then, on the formula given A, B, C, D, and E, you have phi, which is the latitude of the location where you are. Uh, you have beta. You are considering a surface that is going to receive the solar radiation. That surface makes some angle with the horizontal. That angle is called beta. And then you have gamma. Okay, what is gamma? I'm going to explain gamma in the next slide. In order for you to understand all these angles, let's recall that in uh, coordinate systems, you have the Cartesians, you have the spherical coordinates, you have the cylindrical coordinates, and in uh, solar geometry, we use the spherical coordinates. For instance, in geography, you locate a point on the surface of the, the Earth by using the latitude and then the longitude. The radius to the center of the Earth is constant, so you don't need to worry about it. Once you know the latitude, and you know the longitude, you can locate any point on the surface of the Earth. Likewise, look at this picture. In order for you to locate the point here, where the Kessa is, you need three dimensions, because this is a three-dimensional space. So you need an angle theta. Okay, and then you need another angle phi. So if you critically look at these two angles, okay, so uh, theta is like the between two longitudes. 
And if you take the complement of phi, that gives you this angle here. Okay? So this angle is like the latitude. How far are you from the horizontal plane? The equatorial plane. Okay? So longitude and then uh, latitude. They are kind of spherical coordinates. Uh, how do you use that in the sun earth geometry? Look at your screen and the picture on the left. You have the sun, right? Okay. And then you have some coordinate system, a kind of spherical coordinate system made up of south, east, and then zenith. Okay. Likewise, we locate this point. We can also locate the sun in the spherical coordinate system. Where our theta will simply be gamma s. We are trying to locate the sun on the horizontal plane. Where phi will simply be theta z. And its complement will be alpha s. Okay. So let's say uh, you are considering the earth surface. Okay? So the horizontal plane is the equatorial plane. So if you want to locate a point on the surface of the earth, you need the longitude and then you need the latitude. So here, you go beyond the earth surface, you consider the sun and the earth. You have a plane surface, okay, inclined to some angle beta on the surface of the earth, and you want to locate the sun. Because the energy that you are going to collect depends on the position of the sun. So you need two angles. Gamma S which is called solar azimuth angle, and then alpha s, which is called solar altitude. Or if you don't know alpha s, you know theta z, it does the job, because the two are complement, meaning that summing them gives you 90 degrees. Good. If you consider the plane surface, the plane surface has a normal. The normal is that line which is perpendicular to the plane surface. So the plane surface also, the normal, if you want to locate it, you can use, project it on the horizontal plane, and you get some angle called gamma. Okay. Which is simply the azimuth of the surface. Let's make it clear. The terms azimuth, altitude, zenith are not peculiar to solar energy. Even in mathematics, if you go back and look at this figure on the right, this angle in mathematics is called the azimuth angle. And this angle here, phi, is called the zenith angle in mathematics. So we are just translating that into solar energy. So it's not an invention peculiar to solar energy. All right? So the azimuth of the surface is gamma. The azimuth of the sun is gamma s. Okay? Its altitude will be alpha s, and then its zenith will be theta z. And remember that theta z plus gamma s should make 40, 90 degrees. All right? Uh, this figure here will explain better the azimuth and altitude. You have your house, okay, and then the sun is on the space here. So you just need two angles to locate the sun. Don't worry about the distance. The distance is more or less constant. Remember we said the sun is about 150 million kilometers from the earth. So that distance more or less varies uh, plus or minus 3% but it's, it's more or less constant. 
So you never worry about the distance. What you need to know, where is it in space? So you need the azimuth angle and then the altitude angle. If you don't know the altitude angle, you should know the zenith angle. Right. So um, one very important point that I want to make is that when we are considering all these angles, you should agree on a sign convention. When you are going clockwise, uh, what is the sign of your angle? When you are going counterclockwise, what is the, the sign of the angle? And that one depends on your own decision. Or uh, it depends on books, okay? Uh, for this particular class, this particular course, we are going to take any solar azimuth angle which is lying on the left of south, meaning that uh, uh, it's lying west of south to be positive. And uh, when the sun goes on this portion and you project it and gamma s lies here, gamma s is going to be considered as negative. So once again, the azimuth angle is taken to be positive when it is west of south, negative when it is east of south. Okay, same for the surface azimuth angle. Good. So once you know all these angles, you can then compute the angle of incidence of beam radiation using this formula. Now, the zenith angle that we just spoke about can also be defined. You know, the zenith angle is explaining is the complement of the altitude angle. But at the same time, it coincides with the angle of incidence of beam radiation on a horizontal surface. I explain. If you have a horizontal surface, the normal to the horizontal surface will, be, will, be, uh, will coincide with the zenith. It's horizontal. So the surface being horizontal is the normal to this surface will coincide with the zenith. And because of that, the beam radiation we make some angle with the normal to the surface, which is nothing more than the zenith angle. It coincides with the zenith angle. So the zenith angle is like um, uh, putting beta to be equal to zero in this formula. And when you do that, you the formula is reduced and you get the zenith angle. So look at critically the zenith angle. It depends on the latitude, that's where you are. It depends on the declination, the day you are. It depends on the hour angle, the time, the actual time you are. It depends on three parameters, that's all. Good. So, we can define the number of daylight hours. Uh, once again, we said that the sun moves from uh, day to day, the sun moves from one position to the other. And, uh, and because the axis of the earth is inclined, in the movement of the sun, not all surfaces of the earth will be exposed at the same time. I'm not talking about the day and night seeing the sun. I'm talking about seasons. That's why in, 
the northern hemisphere when it is summer in the southern hemisphere it is winter cold because the sun is not seen uh, the same time uh, in different location so from the definition of the zenith angle remember that the zenith angle is the angle made up of the normal to the surface horizontal surface and the line to the sun so if the sun is setting okay um, the normal to a horizontal surface is vertical the sun is setting uh, any line coming from the sun to the surface will be horizontal so consequence the zenith angle when the sun is setting will be 90 degrees and if you put 90 degrees in this formula okay Uh, if you put 90 degrees in this formula, you get cosine 90 degrees equal to zero. You work out, you would then get the hour angle when the sun is setting. That's omega s. And that gives you this formula. And uh, if you want to know the number of daylight hours, So, from uh, vertical to sunset, you get this formula. So, from sunrise to the vertical, you will equally get this formula because it's a symmetry. So, you just need to multiply this formula by 2 to take into account sun rise to some set okay and because one hour or 15 degrees correspond to one hour okay or one hour correspond to 15 degrees okay how many hours will correspond to omega s okay. it's simply omega s divided by by 15 okay and that gives you this so we have some work to example for instance in january the second the declination angle is minus 22.93 we want to know the number of daylight hours capital n in kumasi Kumasi latitude is 6 degrees 34 minutes in the northern hemisphere. So when you put in, in the formula here, you then get 11.62 hours. That's the number of theoretical daylight hours in Kumasi on January the 2nd. The same day, if you compute the number of daylight hours at Levy, a city of Finland, where the latitude is 67 degrees north, you get half, almost half an hour. On January the 2nd, daylight hours at Levy in Finland will be 26. That's about 40 minutes. 40 minutes, a full 24 hours, they will see the sun just 40 minutes on January the 2nd. And then another example, when you go to the southern hemisphere, uh, you take uh, the most remote habitable city. I googled on the, on the net and I saw that it is a city called Ushia in Argentina. That's the most remote southern city on our planet. So its latitude is 54 minus 54 degrees 47 minutes. When you work out, 
the daylight hours, we get 16.9 hours. So that tells you that Kumasi is almost at the latitude, uh, at, the, at the equator. Okay, the latitude is uh, six, it's almost at the equator. Uh, as you are going north, okay, on January the 2nd, okay, uh, roughly this period, we are, we are still uh, in January. So, roughly this period, when you are going up north, the northern hemisphere, okay, uh, the number of daylight hours reduces. Okay. And if you even go further, after Levy, which is at 67, beyond this, they will be in total darkness, 24 hours. Imagine Levy, which is at 67, it's having half an hour. If you go a little bit beyond, you almost get zero. So that tells you that this period, this time around January, the sun is more in the southern hemisphere okay, than in the northern hemisphere. So the daylight hours in this time are, in the, are bigger in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. Good. There are some other solar radiation concepts that uh, we are going to go through quickly. Uh, one is uh, the beam radiation tilt factor. The simply the ratio of beam radiation on a tilted surface to that of horizontal surface. Why all these definitions? So we are giving them all of them. You may, need, you may not need all of them at the same time. But it's good to know all of them. They are all options that you have in solving solar problems. So assuming here, you are able to know the beam radiation on a horizontal surface. You compute it using this formula. And then you compute the beam radiation on a tilted surface. A tilted surface we have a beta not equal to zero. So you compute the angle of beam radiation. You make the ratio, you get what is called the beam radiation tilt factor. Um, I explain. If you measure the beam radiation on a horizontal surface and you want to know the beam radiation on an inclined surface, okay, any inclined surface, by knowing RB, it allows you to do that. It's not superflux to know how to Good. We also have some other definitions. We said that the solar constant, though average is a constant, it varies because the distance from the Earth to the Sun varies. For about plus or minus 3%. three so, and that variation is given in this formula. Okay, solar constant times this one. We've seen it already. Now, if you want to know the amount of solar radiation falling, okay, you locate the sun position and use cosine of the zenith angle, and then you know the theoretical radiation that you could receive. But let's be careful. 
The solar constant is measured above the atmosphere. It is called extraterrestrial radiation. Anything that is beyond the atmosphere is called extraterrestrial. So the solar constant varies, okay? And then the energy that you receive also varies from day to day. Okay. And any time you can know the zenith angle and then you know the total extraterrestrial radiation that you receive. If this is in power, remember solar constant is what per square meter. So it's power. Power, you can integrate it over time and you get energy. So this, for instance, here, you can integrate this one, this, this, uh, this formula, okay? And then you will get, if you have integrated over a day, okay, you will get the daily extraterrestrial radiation. And that gives you this formula. It's a simple integration. Uh, you may try, uh, you may not try, so it's up to you. But uh, when you integrate the previous formula, you get this very one. Uh, the latitude phi, uh, maybe because of the computer problem, it became J, but it's latitude phi. Good. And you can equally integrate the previous formula. Instead of over a day, you can integrate it over an hour. You get hourly extraterrestrial radiation. Or over a month, you get monthly extraterrestrial radiation. Or over a year, you get yearly extraterrestrial radiation. Good. Uh, fairness index. Fairness index measures how cloudy your area is or how covered is your atmosphere or your sky. So it's simply the ratio between the measured monthly average daily radiation, okay, on the ground. And then the computed monthly average daily extraterrestrial radiation, just above the atmosphere. So when you make the ratio, okay, you get a constant called PNS index. And uh, that ratio goes from zero to one. So assuming your clearness index is zero, which is virtually not possible, okay? Zero means your atmosphere is opaque to solar radiation. It's completely covered, it's opaque. Solar radiation cannot come in, you cannot measure. The measured one is zero. On the contrary, a clearness index equal to one means that you have a very clear sky. It's not covered at all. So what you measure on top of the atmosphere is what you, uh, what you computed on top of the atmosphere is what you get, you measure on the ground. So the clearness index is another parameter, very useful parameter used in solar energy. Um, in the following slide, you could see that uh, people use the clearness index to correlate with other solar uh, terms, concepts, like the diffuse radiation if it is ID, and the total radiation which is I, will be equal to this formula here. Okay, depending on the range of the clearness index. Okay. So if you know one, you can compute the other. Naturally knowing your clearness index. Okay. 
Okay. And this formula here, uh, there are many such formulas where people try to correlate, you know, solar, solar radiation uh, data uh, all together. And they can correlate solar radiation diffuse components with TNS index, etc., etc. But these formulas are most of the time empirical formulas, meaning that they are from experiments. People measure and then correlate. Good. To end this chapter, let's talk about the solar measuring equipment. The equipment that you see on your screen is a sunshine recorder. It tells you the number of daylight hours, or let's say the sunshine duration. Okay, you remember we use a formula to compute the number of daylight hours, which is theorem. Practically, depending on where you are really locating, you could you if you are locating in a, on a hill, uh, you may see the sun before those who are located in, um, in a valley. In the morning, if you are located on, on a hill, you can easily see the sun rising compared to people uh, living in the valley. So uh, the theoretical number of daylight hours that we computed previously, practically, you got to measure it, and uh, you measure it using this equipment. It's called a sunshine recorder, named after Campbell. Campbell, the inventor of the equipment. How does it work? So you have the the globe, which is just a magnifying lens. Uh, we all played with magnifying lenses when we were kids, and we used to burn paper with it. So the globe that you see is a magnifying lens. So it magnifies the image of the sun onto a paper, a white paper, lying on this metal where the cursor is. So consequence, the paper will have, will start burning, not burning completely, but it will leave some spots. It's a special paper, not any other paper, okay, that can easily burn. So it's going to leave some spots from sunrise to sunset, then you will, give, you will see a line. And uh, depending on the length of the line, and with some calibrations, you can then compute the actual day length, or the actual sun, sunshine duration of your location in a particular day. So remember that this, what this one records, is always different from the daylight hours that we computed. Okay? To some extent, they are different. Simply because if there is a cloud passage, uh, this equipment early in the morning or some greater part of the morning, some equipment will not, this equipment will not record. Okay? If there is rain, it will not record, etc., etc. So, the second equipment is an equipment measuring the global irradiation. It's what you see. It's called pyranometer. You have a third equipment which measures, measures the beam radiation or the direct radiation, is the same. So, and this equipment here is called per kilometer. 
Parallelometers have a tracking system. Because the beam radiation is a beam, it's a line. And when the sun rises and goes to set, that beam will be changing position. So you need to track the sun in order to measure that beam. So any equipment that measures the beam radiation will have a tracking system that tracks the sun from morning to evening. And uh, also there is a system for tracking the sun from season to season. You rightly said that the sun doesn't appear on the same season in different locations or it doesn't appear on the same location, the same position for in different seasons. So this equipment is having a tracking system. That adds some cost. And they are not very common. I can bet with you as I'm speaking, as we are recording this one, 2011, 2012 rather. So there is no single par kilometer in Ghana, for instance. The equipment is not common, it's quite expensive. So you will easily find sunshine recorders in airports, uh, paranometers in weather stations, but not much of uh, par kilometers. Good. You have this last equipment that measures the diffuse radiation. This equipment here, where my cursor is, is not different from the top one, except that there is a ring that shades the direct radiation. So, Total solar radiation minus direct radiation for horizontal surface, remember, is diffuse. And these equipments are horizontal. So this measures the global, and this we then measure the global minus direct radiation. That gives you diffuse radiation on horizontal surfaces. So it cannot measure the ground reflected, so because it's horizontal, remember we said that previously. Good. The next slide will show a full weather station. This weather station you have uh, uh, been installed uh, at Tua in Ouagadougou, where my colleague Dr. Uh, Azuma works. So you have all the equipment. Uh, you have uh, per kilometer in the middle here. You have hygrometer for measuring relative humidity. Relative humidity is also important in solar calculations, especially uh, for solar air conditioning, solar cooling, and solar drying. It is very important. So this weather station has a hygrometer that measures the relative humidity. It has a wind vane that measures the wind speed and uh, the, I mean the, the wind direction. And then you have an anemometer that measures the wind speed. Paranometer that measures the global radiation. Okay. Uh, you have two paranometers side by side, one should be measuring the global radiation and the other should be measuring the diffuse radiation. But unfortunately, this one doesn't have uh, the ring. For some reason, maybe it has been taken off. Okay. Good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of chapter one. Thank you for your attention.